Um, and when we talk about manufacturing, brings me to car producers. Who of you lately bought a new car? None, who wants to buy a new car and finds it incredibly difficult because you have hundreds of thousands of possibilities to choose the right car. Like, different color is easy. Uh, different tires, different leather seats, different window tilt or not tinted. Um, rooftop, no rooftop. Motor, of course, in different values. I mean, hundreds of thousands of possibilities, individual needs, but the car producer needs to be prepared for that. So that's bringing lots of challenges into the production business as well. But my colleagues, Timo Mühlhausen and Magnus Edholm, will unveil how you can solve these problems and overcome the hurdles. So welcome up on stage, Magnus Edholm and Timo Mühlhausen. Thank you. English? Think, yes. Yes, good. It's more thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Siemens booth. 3,000 square meters of electrification, automation, digitalization, and Timo Mühlhausen. And Magnus Eto. In the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to talk about digitalization and the digital enterprise in particular, because as we know, digitalization is changing everything. And it's really changing everything. Let's start in our private lives. Think about how you book your next vacation or your next holidays. What do you do? You go to the internet, you search for the hotel or the destination, you look, okay, what kind of feedbacks were coming in. So you get, I would say, influence of what you can read exactly in the easy to access way. And that's also a way how our businesses are more or less influenced. And that's one of the reasons because information are getting so quickly from one to the other that also the business models will change. So business models due to digitalization, new platforms, new way of communication in the speed that some of the last, I would say, Fortune 500 of 2000 Fortune 500 companies do not, did not unfortunately survive, so there are only 500 left of them when we look some years back. And there is a second thing, because when we talk about communication and information flowing forth and back, there is a lot of data consumed. And exactly with this data, the next trillion dollar will be generated and it's up to you if you want to earn some of that. Right, right, right. And I also see in the audience, you're looking on your smartphone, you're taking photos, hopefully posting on Twitter, which we appreciate, of course. <laughs> So there's a lot about digitalization happening around us everywhere. But this is not music of the future. This would be music of the past, which I actually experienced. You did not. And I tell you, those of you who had the experience to work with those vinyl players, it was not a bad time. You could smell the, the vinyl. You could read the lyrics. Yes, fantastic to me. But I don't know what you talk no, about. It's it was not. It was before my time, so... Millennials, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> anyway, there were some issues, though, and I want to use this example to explain to you what we think is digitalization. So, for example, if I want to go for a run back in the days, I could not take one of those on my back. There's no cables long enough, and obviously the needle will jump around. So, that would be like the analog approach. Then someone came along and presented a CD, and we thought everything will change now. But to be honest, nothing changed that much. We took something analog and turned it into something digital. But for running, it was not even enough so far. Well, you could <laughs> if you had this bump <laughs> clear device, but I don't, even go, don't want to go there. But then in the middle of the 2000, 2004, 2006, uh, iTunes and Spotify came along and things changed. In a way, we consume music. Uh, we could easily create a playlist of our choice, and the algorithms behind those solutions actually listen to and analyze what we're listening to and propose music for us, which is good. I mean, I know you, Timo, you're a very sporty guy. Every morning you run your 10 kilometers, right? Yeah, minimum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know uh, I'm not running alone anymore, since these devices are now also tracking my behavior. So they are, I'm generating data by yeah. listening music. So yeah. it so would be nice morning. if also the shoes could talk to me. Yeah, so this morning, you also, I think you ran the wrong morning and you had this, I think it was Jump Van Halen that came along. Anyway, with the shoes, obviously it would be nice if the shoes could also react in the same way. Not run for you, but at least be customized for you. And that's where we are today. Today, any one of us can order the shoes customized for your stature, your weight, the way you're running, where you're running. And that we're not paying too much more money than for a mass-produced shoe. And what I want to come to is 
that customization of products is going to be very high in the very near future. Probably going to look at 80% of all products are going to be customized. And if you just taste that for a while, that's what we're looking at. And this creates challenges for the manufacturing It's industry. really impressive how, how this degree of, uh, I should say, individualization is growing. But when we think about it, independent of which industry we're talking about, there are some requirements which are common for all the industries. It doesn't matter, is it train, is it uh, electronics, or is it food and beverage? Let's start with the first, this is go-to-market. Everybody's talking about go-to-market, but what's it about? It's about reacting on your customers' demands even faster. So developing a new machine, considering new requirements, developing, developing a new laptop, or we would say a field PG. Um, it's all about be being quick being responding, responsive to the market requirements, but also the flexibility. You just mentioned 80% of individualization. So flexibility, it's about talking about lot size one. And 2015, we have been presenting here on this uh, fair a, uh, a machine from the company Optima where we could show how lot size one production and a serious production was possible. And uh, the quality, I just mentioned it. When you search for new products or you buy new things, the first thing you do, you search in the internet and you get, and you want to know about the quality and so. So you read about what everybody's talking about, so, special, so having a special eye on it, what quality you really produce and what quality your product represents. And the efficiency, well, in the past it was very often the talk about how much you're producing, but that's not even anymore the case. Now we talk about how much resources you're consuming. And the best idea or best thing to talk about is the electrification. So how much energy are we consuming in producing a laptop, a field PG, or whatever product? So it's a competitive advantage to be a green company. And when we talk about digitalization and all these requirements, then it's all about data, generating data while running, while producing a product. So we generate data and this is more or less our intellectual property. So we have to secure that and this data is also communicated, not only horizontally in the production line, encapsulated, no, also vertically, it will leave probably also your company. So make sure that these are encrypted communication ways, but in totally think about an appropriate security concept for your machines. So a lot of challenges, just a few that Timo just mentioned. And the question is, how do we tackle those challenges? And our take on it is to go digital, basically to do a digitalization of the entire value creation chain. This is how we see it. It's five steps from design of the product to planning, engineering, production, and service. And what we want to achieve is to make data or information flow from the initial idea through the entire value chain, so making sure that all stakeholders involved in this process has access to the data they need at that very right moment in time to do the, make the best decision and build the best product. And this is based on uh, Team Center, our collaboration platform. In the background, we have our MindSphere, cloud-based open IoT operating systems, which allows for analysis of data both product data and production data. And we can feed that back in the process in order to optimize both the product and the production. And when everything is floating in a very nice way, very harmonized, back and forth, up and down, at that point in time, something magic happens. I would say something unique happens in this market. So in our offering would be the digital enterprise suite. By using all these tools we offer, something really unique can happen. And that's the digital twin. The digital twin represents a virtual copy of your real machine, product, and processes. And that's exactly the way how you can simulate in a virtual environment modifications on your machine, new production of new products. And only in the moment when you're satisfied with the behavior in the virtual environment, you start to think about the real world and start to think about investing in the real world, real resources. Right. And we're running the risk of becoming a bit more theoretical. So we have chosen to explain this using one of our own products, the Semantic Field PG. PG stands for Programmiergerät and is German for laptop. Well, I would say it's a laptop with specific interfaces to have an easy access to the automation. Right. So this laptop was built using our own software products for construction, for simulation, for planning, for engineering, and commissioning, and on, so on and so forth. That's a quick movie, but 
to rest assured, you can go and see all this in detail at the five stations in the center of our booth at the digital enterprise area. So based on this product, what do we have? We have well, this was just an impression, an impression which was generated on data, so more or less generated out of the digital twin. Right. And this digital twin, let's have a closer look into it. This digital twin consists of three things. First is the digital twin about the product. I would say everybody who is designing products with tools like NX, uh, NX Suite components, for instance, you know the CAD drawings and so Not only for the product, and the second digital twin, that's the digital twin of the production. So that means the production machine, the line, or even the entire plant. And the third digital twin, that's the digital twin which really generates now data about the behavior of the product, but also of the machine. That's the digital twin for performance, which generates the data while using the product, for instance, this field PG, this laptop, or while using the production machine. So that means in both assets, so to say, you generate data. And this data from the assets you can use, I guess. Right. So we use the data and we turn this big data into smart data, taking out the best and the most informative parts of this and feed it back into the digital twin of the product and the production. And the nice thing is we managed also one integrated data model called Team Center. So the solution required for this that we're offering is called the Digital Enterprise Suite, and it looks like this. You see the three, three bubbles on the top? To the left, that would be the product development area. In the middle, you have the interface between the top floor and the shop floor, and to the right, the automation portfolio, all based on one platform called Team Center, and in the background, we got MindSphere. Since we know that uh, the SPS IPC drives trade show is a place where a lot of machine builders come along, we have chosen to show an example on how we connect the product development environment, as PLM as we call it here, and the automation, and basically show how you could build a machine. I know there's a lot of machine builders here. And to explain this in a very short way, we have our design environment, the modeling environment, where we model the machine in 3D, we construct the mechanics, we define the joints, perhaps even put in the electronics and also the automation. And in order to prove and test this machine, we use a virtual controller. And then when everything is working, we simply build the machine. This is that is, simple? Yes, it's simple. And to be honest, that's real. We're not talking about the future. We're talking about something we are showing here on the booth. So we offer already the portfolio, which allows you to really do work with this scenario. And we call it software in the loop. So that means we have the virtual environment, the virtual machine, and we have the, um, real, uh, the, the automation components connected to it. So how do we do it? So how do we connect the virtual world and the real world? So first, the design of the machine, for instance, from NX Mechatronics Concept Designer, that's the uh, software which you can use to design the machine. On the other hand, we have the TIA portal. That's the engineering framework with which you bring life into your automation components, your HMI, your drives, and all the components you usually use on the field level. So now you want to bring the real PLC code in connection to the virtual model. So there is one component missing, which is the virtual controller, the PLC SIM Advanced. And this is now the way how you connect or how you load the PLC program the program you write or maybe generate from your existing libraries, you put it into your PLC SIM advanced, and this is how you operate the virtual environment with the real PLC code. That means you validate your PLC code before you start using this PLC code in the real machine. So that means you reduce your time to market by reducing, <laughs> in particular, your commissioning time. Right. And this machine um, actually exists, and it actually exists here at the booth. And it's from the company Bausch and Ströbel. And perhaps some of you were here um, just a few hours ago when the, the manager from or the uh, CEO. Dr. Geringer was here, exactly. Yeah. He was exactly explaining how, how, or which advantage he could take by using this, uh, I would say, uh, approach with using a virtual environment and the real environment and combining it by the model of the digital twin. Mm -hmm. And uh, the plan is to reduce the engineering effort and the commissioning time by 30% up to 2020. And they took already <laughs> nice approaches on that. So we've come to an end of our presentation. The lamp is blinking red. And uh, as you know, we are here 
And we'll be glad to meet you up in the circle and talk to you about this perhaps more in detail and dig deep into the entire value creation chain and, of course, also the machine, which is a very nice example. So thank you very much, Timo, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Magnus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magnus and Timo. Yeah.